This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. And this is my first time to this meeting, and I'd like to thank uh, the, the organizers, Drs. Conti, Owens, and Riley for the kind invitation. Uh, I was really impressed with the morning session. Um, so my objective, these are my disclosures. I have to disclose that I have no experience with the Nelix device, but the title of my talk is New and Emerging Devices, and these are the current FDA-approved EVAR devices. Uh, you can see the excluder, Zenith, Endologix, Endurant, Ovation, and Lombard. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about one new device. That's the Ovation Prime device, which is FDA approved. And I'm going to talk about an emerging device, and that is the Nelix device. So the Ovation Prime abdominal stent graft is a unique stent graft. It does rely on proximal fixation. The unique features of this stent graft are its main body that has an injectable polymer. It ha actually has no physical stents on the outside of it. It has one suprarenal um, bare stent for proximal fixation. Uh, a 14 French outer diameter main body, uh, tri-modular design, and the limbs are each uh, 13 to 14 French outer diameter. This is what the stent graft system looks like. And it has uh, an auto injector with uh, an injectable polymer. I'm going to go through the, the stent graft procedure with uh, a few of the cases that we've done. So these are the, the results of the pivotal trial, the three-year results. And you can see that um, uh, there was a low rate of major adverse events at 0 to 30 days and out to one year. Uh, uh, no ruptures, no conversions to open repair, and uh, no type 1 or 3 endoleaks. However, there is an issue with type 2 endoleaks. I'll comment on that uh, in a little bit. When you look at the challenging subgroup analysis, and what I mean by the challenging subgroup analysis, out of the 161 patients, there were 66 patients who had either minimum, minimum access vessel diameters of less than 6 millimeters, that was in 25% of the uh, patient population, and a neck length of uh, less than 10 millimeters in 8%, and both of those criteria were met in 8%. And you can see that the major adverse event rate was uh, zero, 3% at one year, no ruptures, no conversions, and so very encouraging results for this challenging subgroup population. And I'm gonna uh, show you some of the results of those challenging patients in my own experience. When you look at the effectiveness rates at one year compared with other devices, the Ovation Prime device compares favorably uh, against other devices. Neck length measurement is, um, uh, is interesting in this device. It's taken some time for me to learn how to uh, to uh, measure for the, the neck length and the neck diameter uh, for this device. The uh, self-expanding stents, in contrast to the Ovation Prime device standard endographs, uh, look at a neck length of a, uh, a 10 to 10% 10 change over the diameter of the neck, whereas Ovation Prime uh, uses a different um, uh, measurement criteria. There's a, it's a very novel design, and so it's, uh, it's not necessarily a continually dilating uh, uh, stent graft, whereas other stent grafts are oversized. This graft is sized to fit the anatomy and to inflate these O-rings into the neck to create seal. And what I like to describe it as is a pinch effect. You have this suprarenal stent that has downward going barbs, and when you inflate the O-rings down below with the polymer, it causes the the stent graft to pinch into place to ob obtain um, adequate seal. The novel design, when you look at standard stent grafts on the left, you have a lot of uh, material end stent within the sheath, whereas the Ovation Prime device removes all of the metallic uh, substance out of the device, so they're able to package the stent graft into a smaller delivery system and then inject the, the solidifying polymer at a later stage of the deployment and then achieve adequate seal. 
So uh, the one-year outcomes, this was uh, published by Manny Mehta in the Journal of Vascular Surgery. I just wanted to point out a couple of things. This is uh, freedom from any event over time, and this is a, a favorable uh, uh, graph. But when you look at type 2 endoleaks, this is one of the things that I think stands out about this device. The, the rate of type 2 endoleak was quite high. It was 34% uh, at one year, and that's higher than other stent grafts, but I think it's uh, worth considering when you're looking at this device. Now here's uh, what the device looks like implanted in a patient of mine. Uh, you can see that you can see this uh, suprarenal stent and you can begin to see the polymer injected. It takes, uh, the original polymer took about 20 minutes to cure. Um, now they have a polymer that's rapidly curing and it's down to 14 minutes. But you can see the polymer injecting up and over and, and filling the O-rings and then down into that contralateral limb where it becomes uh, clearly visible for gait cannulation. Here's a uh, patient of mine that I had enrolled into one of my investigational device exemption clinical trials uh, for fenestrated endografting. She was an 86-year-old woman who uh, was quite vibrant. Her mother lived to be 104, and she was convinced she would do the same. Uh, she had a very short neck, nine millimeters in length, and uh, we attempted to do a physician-modified stent graft on her, but. Uh, during the procedure, she had very small iliacs, and when we went to uh, advance the device up, I ruptured her right external iliac artery. You can see that I have proximal balloon occlusion here. At this point in the operation, I decided to abort in this elderly woman to see how she tolerated the repair, the iliofemoral bypass that we performed on her. Um, and so we got uh, control of the injury, and she actually did very well. Uh, she was discharged within four days uh, without repair of her stent graft, but she, I elected to bring her back because of her small access vessels. This is a woman that was now in one of my trials that now had to be withdrawn, and uh, we uh, placed an ovation prime stent graft, and as you can see here, uh, up to the level of the renal arteries, deployment of the suprarenal stent, successful uh, exclusion of the of the aneurysm, and then we place the limbs down into the uh, into the iliacs. You can see this is her Dyna CT that was done in the operating room, and her follow-up CT scan that shows complete exclusion uh, of the uh, of the aneurysm. So this is a, a woman with a very short nine millimeter neck who we successfully treated. This is her one year outcome. She's now 87. Here's another patient with severe angulation, and this is a, a case that I would caution you uh, in, where we had the O-rings tilted a little bit, and we didn't get good seal up in that stent graft, so we actually had to place two uh, ICAST stents proximally in order to obtain a uh, good seal. But angulation can be an issue with this device. However, it hasn't been an issue with us so far. And this was the completion angiogram on this particular patient. What you'll notice about a lot of these patients is that they all have small access, and I think that's an advantage of this device. Here's another case, and this is uh, one where we got into a little bit of trouble. Uh, a very narrow terminal aorta, very small iliac vessels. Uh, we went to deploy the, the graft, and you can see that the contralateral limb is compressed in that distal flow channel. And I can show you that right here. That, that was very difficult to cannulate. Uh, we could easily cannulate the ipsilateral side, but we couldn't cannulate the contralateral side. So uh, instead of coming from the arm, which would have been an option, we just came up that ipsilateral side, um, got a wire down through the contralateral side, snared it from the same side, and then pulled that wire out, and then we're able to get a stiff wire up into that contralateral side and, and save uh, this procedure from having to be advanced. And here's the, the completion. One of the things that uh, uh, the manufacturer does not recommend is ballooning of the proximal seal zone unless, unless you absolutely have to. And if you feel like you have a compromised neck, you may want to use the polymer that is longer curing uh, because that will give you the opportunity to go up and seal that with a balloon if you, uh, if you need to. And there's the follow-up, sorry, that's the follow-up. Uh, CT scan on that particular patient. So I've done seven of these procedures, mostly on uh, little old ladies with small access vessels, but you can see our average fluoro time is about 20 minutes. Procedure time, a couple of hours. It takes us a little bit longer to do these cases because there is a cure time of 20 minutes of the polymer and uh, a small amount of contrast. 
this is a patient, um, this is the last uh, patient I'm going to describe. This is a patient with a large type 1A endoleak with a trivascular device. And what you can see here, this is a patient who was treated in Texas. I think this was poor patient selection, an elderly gentleman. But it's interesting here. I went up and shot an arteriogram. And look at this. You can see the aneurysm here. And you can see the endoleak. But in this early phase injection, you can see those two O-rings right here. And you can see the contrast flowing out along the outer aspect of those, of those O-rings. And so we uh, uh, came in from above and placed a bunch of coils to seal this endoleak and uh, get out of trouble. This is not a patient, this graft is not amenable to the Aptis endoanchor device. I think this was just a, an example of poor patient selection. You can see the neck there is almost four centimeters in diameter. Well, to move on to the Nelix device, uh, I'm going to speak a little bit. I don't have any experience with the Nelix device, but it's an interesting device. Um, I'm going to talk about the global registry. And uh, here's the Nelix endovascular aneurysm sealing. Instead of EVAR, it's called EVAS. It's a new generation of endovascular technology. And it's designed to seal the entire aneurysm and to overcome limitations with conventional endografts. What you can see is that all it, all it requires is placement of wires from each side up into the uh, aortic neck and deployment of two balloon, long balloon expandable stents and then a uh, filling of the endo bag with polymer under pressure monitoring to completely fill the aneurysm sac. This is what the delivery system in the console looks like. It looks like something out of Battlestar Galactica. It's uh, got a, a, a pressure manifold for infusing the polymer and uh, deploying the stents. And just to stay on time, here's a, an example of the endo bag and one of the uh, balloon expandable stents uh, conforms to and seals the, uh, the aneurysm. When you look at the evidence pathway, there was the Nelix feasibility study that enrolled 35 patients up until 2012. Uh, and you can see that the EVAS global registry is uh, going to be completed with three-year follow-up in 2017. Uh, they, the company believes that the device will be launched in, uh, in the U.S. in 2017, so about a, a year and a half. Uh, principal investigators were Andrew Holden and Matt Thompson, 300 patients, 30 centers. Um, and just to move forward, um, the enrollment was completed in September of 2014. In this study, it's interesting, of these 300 patients, there were four cohorts. They divided the patients into four cohorts. And these cohorts were 190 patients enrolled with a neck length of uh, greater than 10 millimeters, uh, 41 patients with a short neck aneurysm, 5 to 10 millimeters, and some infrarenal neck angulation. Interestingly, they included a cohort, and this will be the first time we've actually had good data on snorkels and chimneys, but a, a cohort of 31 patients with a short neck length and uh, 16 chimney procedures performed in this cohort. And then the fourth cohort was a, a cohort of 12 patients that presented with rupture. So this is going to be exciting to get these data. So over six months, uh, we have some preliminary endoleak data. Uh, how did the devices stack up with regard to endoleak? The Nelix registry would suggest within 30 days that they have the lowest endoleak rate of 1%. We have yet to determine that. The Ovation Prime device, you see a very high rate of type 2 endoleak, but a very low rate of type 1 and 3 endoleak. So this is how all the devices now stack up. So in discussion, I think the Ovation Prime device, which is FDA approved, uh, I use it for patients with challenging access. Uh, I would be careful with short necks. Uh, it does take some experience in learning how to size these, these uh, endographs, but I think it is a, a device that, that represents uh, an alternative to some of the other large uh, devices. It may be attractive for this, uh, this idea of snorkeling in select patients because of the O-ring being able to seal around the snorkels. Um, and Nelix, I think we need to await the results of the EVAS Global Registry. Um, it may be a go-to device for ruptures. We don't know. It'll be interesting to see what that fourth cohort looks like. I'm concerned about what the bailout is for failures because if with two of those uh, balloon expandable stents going clear up to the renals, I don't know how I would fix a problem with this device if, it, if uh, the patient were to develop a large type 1 endoleak. I think it would require open explant. Um, I think it has a unique uh, opportunity to treat thoracic aneurysms. I think it's a, a, an exciting technology. Thank you for your uh, time.